All right, so thanks everyone for uh, tuning in and watching. Um, this week we're very to have, happy to have uh, Manus Visser from Amsterdam, who's going to tell us about his work with Ted Jacobson on gravitational thermodynamics of causal diamonds in ADS. Manus, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a really a pleasure to talk uh, for such a nice virtual audience. Um, thank you. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is based on work with Ted Jacobson, which is published in this archive uh, number. Um, and let me just dive into the motivations. So this is a nice picture of a diamond, which I will explain uh, later. So the motivation comes really from horizon thermodynamics, which was first discovered for black holes, but was then also quickly extended to uh, the Sitter and Rinter horizons by a number of people. Um, but these are really global structures. So uh, the question is, <clears throat> how local can the notions of horizon thermodynamics be applied? Another motivation comes from like the emergence of gravity and deriving Einstein's equation. <clears throat> so this has been uh, uh, done uh, up to second order in ADS-CFT using uh, fundamental properties of entanglement entropy. Um, but if we want to extend these derivations to other space times, then uh, that's kind of hard because uh, the sitter or a flat space, for example, they, they don't have a time-like boundary. Um, so again, maybe if we, um, if we look locally uh, at uh, any point in space time, maybe around that neighborhood, we can derive the Einstein equation without any reference to an ADS boundary. And this, of course, uh, builds on work by uh, uh, Jacobson uh, from 95 and 2015. So in this talk, I will take the, the a local gravitational subsystem to be a causal diamond, which is defined as the domain of dependence of a spatial ball. So this, let me emphasize that this causal diamond lives in the bulk of space-time, whereas um, in the literature, people have also studied causal diamonds uh, on the boundary of ADS but this is really in the book. So another motivation <clears throat> comes from uh, a paper by Jacobson in 2015, where um, he derived the Einstein equations, and he basically considered small causal diamonds in any space-time uh, and viewed them as small deformations of maximally symmetric diamonds. And he um, argued that the semi-classical Einstein equation is equivalent to the stationarity of the total entanglement entropy for such diamonds. And you can see that in a formula here. So this is the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, and it's being varied at fixed volume. So this is the volume of the spatial slice of the ball um, in the diamond. And this is the matter entropy. So together they form the um, generalized entropy. The, so the sum of bekenstein hawking entropy and matter entropy is the generalized entropy. And the statement is that the uh, variation away from a, a maximally symmetric diamond is zero. Um, and he showed that that is equivalent to the semi-classical Einstein equation. Uh, but there are some peculiar features of this derivation, namely, um, the volume has to be fixed, and it wasn't really clear why that had to be. So um, that was one question. And uh, another one is that he treated uh, conformal and non-conformal quantum matter uh, in a different way. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, first of all derive the entanglement equilibrium statement. So that's this equation for maximally symmetric diamonds from a, um, from a first law, basically a first law for diamonds. And um, secondly, I will reformulate this uh, entanglement equilibrium statement as in terms of free energy. And then in the second part of the talk, I will uh, start with the stationarity of free energy for maximally, symmet maximally symmetric diamonds and use that as, an new, as a new input to derive, again, the, the Einstein equations. And um, this new input has the advantage that uh, the volume is not fixed 
and it treats conformal and non-conformal matter in, uh, on the same uh, footing. So, in a, uh, so we, yeah, we, so we consider uh, maximally symmetric diamonds of arbitrary sizes. Uh, so, in particular, they could be small but also large. And uh, some interesting limiting cases are the sitter, uh, the static patch of the sitter space, uh, the Riddler wedge, both in flat space and in ADS, and the Wheeler the width patch in ADS. Um, so, another motivation is that the thermodynamics of the sitter static patch, which is, which is really a causal diamond in the sitter, is not so well understood. So we'll actually start with uh, revisiting that and advocating for a negative temperature interpretation in that case. And um, what is well, an interesting feature is that uh, about black hole thermodynamics is that only, of course, the horizon area appears in the first law, not the volume of some spatial slice. Whereas in the first law for causal diamonds, both the area and the volume are being varied. And um, I will discuss the interpretation of the volume term in that uh, first law. And of course, that begs the question, like, what, is there a connection with, uh, with recent proposals uh, uh, regarding complexity equals uh, volume? by Suskind and others. Okay, so this is the plan of the talk. I will first talk about uh, thermodynamics of causal diamonds in ADS, which is mainly based on this paper with uh, Ted. And then, but it's also based on an earlier work with uh, Pablo Bueno, Anthony Speranza, and Vincent Min. And the sec in the second part, I will um, uh, discuss this derivation of the Einstein equation from a free energy condition which is based on an essay, a Gravity Research Foundation essay with Jacobson, which will appear tomorrow on the archive. <laughs> so let me start. Let me actually start just with a very simple case, uh, the sitter static patch. So um, well, first of all, uh, of course, black hole thermodynamics is very important in the endeavor of understanding quantum gravity. In particular, it has taught us about the holographic principle and about the emergence of gravity. Um, and I wanted to focus on, a, on this first law for uh, static black holes, so uh, uh, non-rotating black holes, but with a surrounding uh, fluid matter. Um, and this was actually derived uh, in the early 70s by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking. So there's this additional, I mean, this is very familiar, but there's this additional integral over the stress tensor and then contracted with the killing, the time-like killing vector and a, uh, uh, a unit normal to a surface, uh, a spatial uh, slice that um, really runs from the bifurcation surface uh, up to uh, spatial infinity. Um, so, Yes, so this is, uh, this is known for black holes, um, but uh, other causal horizons also have thermodynamic properties, of course, um, and I will in particular focus on uh, the cosmological horizon in the sitter space. And there, of course, there is no, um, no asymptotic spatial infinity, so um, there's no, uh, you cannot define the ADM mass, so that, that uh, side will be uh, zero. So you only have uh, the variation of the horizon area uh, of the bifurcation point, which is here. Uh, and the slice is really the slice in, in the static patch and uh, xi is the time-like filling factor in the sitter space. Okay, but uh, what is interesting here is that if you take this integral to the other side is that you have a minus sign. Um, between uh, this integral and the area variation compared to the plus sign here between uh, the matter, the, the ADM mass variation and the area variation. So, um, yes, yeah, so both first laws were originally derived by varying a SMAR formula, but they can equivalent be derived uh, from Walt's uh, procedure. But what is the interpretation of this minus sign? So there are two proposals in the literature. Um, 
And one is from, from Strominger, Spradlin, and Volovich. And uh, they say, okay, the minus sign, you have to actually incorporate it in the energy, basically. So um, the energy on the other side of the horizon, so on, a, on, on this slice, that is the negative of the energy uh, defined on this slice. Um, and that is because the sitter space is closed, so the total energy has to be uh, zero. Um, and they basically propose that you have to take the, the uh, energy on the, on the other side, on a slice of, on the other side of the horizon. So, um, well, you could object to that, that it's, it's kind of, oh wait, this line should be uh, uh, oppositely directed. So it's it's uh, slightly weird because well, first of all, if you think that the thermodynamic system is really just associated with the diamond, why do you talk about the other side? Secondly, um, which is drawn uh, incorrectly here, but on the other side, the the, the killing vector really runs uh, to the uh, points to the past, um, whereas here it points to the future. So you might. Well, it's it, it's it's slightly weird to take the energy uh, with respect to the past pointing killing factor. And thirdly, an objection against this proposal is that for finite causal diamonds, which we'll see, which I will talk about later, um, this equality does not hold because um, well, this equality really hinges on uh, the closeness of uh, of the sitter space and the fact that the the horizon really sits in the middle. So um, yeah, for finite diamonds, uh, I don't really see how, how you would implement this proposal. So, but there's another, um, another proposal for understanding this minus sign and it's just to incorporate it in the temperature so that the temperature is minus the, the gibbons hawking temperature. Okay, and then, and you actually have a consistent uh, thermodynamic law, but uh, with a negative temperature. So let me motivate this negative temperature for the sitter space. Um, so typically negative absolute, I'm talking about absolute temperature, of course, uh, requires of a system first that uh, it's Hilbert space is finite dimensional. Um, and uh, well, it has been advocated by Banks, Tom Banks and Willy Fischler, that this actually holds for the sitter space basically because of the holographic principle. So the holographic principle would say that the, um, would imply that the uh, entropy associated to the cosmological horizon is finite and hence the uh, Hilbert space is finite dimensional. So the second requirement is that the energy spectrum is bounded from above. Well, and this um, also holds in the sitter space, arguably, because the energy in the sitter space is bounded by the mass of the largest black hole that fits inside the cosmological horizon. And this is called the Narayan black hole. Um, and actually, Clem and Vansa were the first, I think, to uh, propose this negative temperature in the sitter space, and they really pointed this out. So, yeah. Do you have an intuitive explanation of what the finite dimensional constraint has to do with um, what is required for consistency here? The finite dimensional? Um, yeah, so I think, I think here this picture explains it. So um, this is the entropy and this is the energy. So if you have uh, like a spin system, for example, with um, just um, a finite dimensional Hilbert space spin system, finite size spin system, then uh, there is a maximal entropy. Um, and just at some point uh, you've reached the, the maximum, like when pumping energy into the system or, or yeah, uh, heating up the system, then at some point it has reached a maximum. And then if you, um, if you increase the energy again, uh, the entropy will go down. And that is, um, well, by the definition of temperature is negative temperature. So negative slope in this picture, in this uh, picture means negative temperature and positive slope means positive temperature. 
Does that answer your question? So, so do you know do you know non gravitational examples of systems that have such a property? Yeah, yeah, like finite dimensional spin systems have have negative temperature. It's the normal statistical definition of temperature, right? Uh, so that this is the, this is like the thermodynamic definition of temperature, I would say, and yeah. So there exist there exist systems with uh, with negative temperature, and and so, like here you see it's somehow like above above uh it's it's not uh, i mean it's somehow above uh, infinite temperature but this is just because of the definition i guess um, in euclidean quantum gravity you think about also temperature as a periodicity of the thermal circle right yes is there like a way of uh, thinking about this negative temperature yeah but that i think that is in the canonical ensemble where you fix the temperature um uh, here, here's the answer. It's the same. Oh, okay, good. And so, um, yeah, we, we. This is actually an open question that I have at the end. So maybe in the microeconomical ensemble, you could derive this temp this negative temperature, because okay. then temperature maybe is not good for you. I'm thinking canonical ensemble, in which case I would identify the temperature as related to the number of microstates, and then it just keeps going up as I. Mm -hmm. This picture, then I'm confused as to why it goes down. Okay, but you're in the microeconomical ensemble here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then why do I need it to be finite dimensional? Doesn't that, doesn't your example here, uh, well, uh, because otherwise this line would go up, like at some point it has to, um, it has, yeah, at some point it cannot increase the, en the, the, the entropy anymore. I see. Good. Ah, good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is also called pop population inversion so it's some so so you like you uh increase the number of degrees of freedom and then at some point you decrease it again um okay so in so, so in the sitter space this kind of naturally happens because adding positive energy to uh, inside the, the static patch results in a decrease in gravitational entropy this is basically what the first law tells you um, okay, so then let's discuss the um, let's discuss a puzzle. So of course we know that uh, Gibbons Hawking temperature or the Hawking temperature is positive for the sitter space, and um, that's all that's all true. So if you have uh, quantum fields on top of a, uh, a classical background, fixed classical background, then um, when restricted to uh, to the causal diamond in the sitter space, the vacuum is really a thermal state uh, with respect to the Hamiltonian that generates time translations. So uh, the density matrix is really just uh, a thermal density matrix with a positive temperature. But um, this doesn't really contradict the first law because the first law is about um, is about back reaction and about the self gravitating system, whereas this computation is about uh, quantum fields in a fixed classical background. So let me back that up with, with some formulas. So here I have the first law again, uh, where now I take the quantum expectation value of the matter Hamiltonian. So um, because of the first law of well, thermodynamics, or of, of, of well, we think of now as of, of entanglement. Um, this, well, this Hamiltonian is really just a modular Hamiltonian. So, due to the first law, this variation um, of the expectation value of the matter Hamiltonian is really the temperature, positive temperature times variation of matter entropy. In this step, I'm using the first law. Um, the first law for a matter. So, uh, and then here I'm using the, the Hawking, Gibbons Hawking temperature, and uh, uh, the area is really the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So, um, well, you see that on this side I have a positive temperature for matter, but on this side I can basically have this negative temperature, like if I just say, postulate that this is the negative temperature. Um, but this is all still consistent because. Um, the matter entropy and the black hole entropy actually have to combine 
to form the generalized entropy, which is the sum of, of the two. So if this temperature were positive, then they don't combine, then they, they uh, then you only have the difference between them. So this temperature kind of has to be negative uh, in order for the two uh, entropies to combine to form the generalized entropy, which is, um, uh, well, a very desirable kind of entropy because it uh, obeys the generalized second law and it's supposed to be UV uh, finite. So, um, um, in that sense, positive temperature for, for quantum fields and negative temperature for, uh, for the causal diamond are really consistent. So basically, sorry, so, so, so you're saying that, uh, well, the, the mass, the total mass is zero. So you're saying something like that the, 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 the change in the, in the gravitational entropy has to be compensated by the change in the matter entropy. So yes. Like, uh, you're changing the entropy of, of, of quantum fields that probably you take as, as, as in time entropy. So so, yeah, this, the entropy of quantum fields really comes from this term. Mm. So that's uh, that's uh, something that's. Um, but are you are you now expanding? I mean, like uh, previously, you were displaying the the first law, I mean, thermodynamic first law, right? You have like the the in, like the, the internal energy, so like the the, the, the change in mass zero, right? And you have like a TDS uh, plus a contribution from matter fields, right? So are we, are we now talking about this contribution from matter fields from the matter fields? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So sorry, this is really the same as as a, as this equation as the one, as the equation I had above. So um, so this equation you were talking about, yeah. this is really delta h. Okay, very good. So uh, that's this this term. This is like a thermodynamic entropy of the matter fields. It's not a entropy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, good. And what's interesting is that um, you cannot include both in the first law, in a gravitational first law. So either the energy appears there for matter or, or the entropy for matter. It would be wrong to, to actually um, to include them both. That's a peculiar feature of gravity actually. Um, that you also see for black holes, sorry to, to scroll. Uh, so here you only have this, this energy term. And if you want, you can translate this into an entropy term for matter. And then it would add to this area, but like either you have the energy, um, which is then really a gravitational law because this is also energy. This is geometry, this is energy, or you have, um, uh, the entropy for matter, but you cannot have them both at the same time in the first law. But somehow, like en entropy for matter is important, right? Because like that's something that that was always like uh, in the spot experiments about, uh, you know, mm -hmm. something, I mean, something that has a finite temperature and entropy. Fully yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, it is important, and that's why we we have this argument here is that we translate it in terms of matter entropy, and then you actually see that. Um, that it, that it combines with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So it is, yeah. Okay, so um, this, uh, this stationarity of generalized entropy for the sitter space um, is uh, slightly more general, as I will argue now. So, uh, first of all, this, well, there are several arguments that the total entropy of the sitter vacuum is actually maximal. So here you only see that it's stationary, um, but there are arguments that it's actually uh, maximal because adding matter or a black hole inside uh, the static patch only decreases the horizon entropy. So that uh, uh, the area of the cosmological horizon of empty the sitter space is really uh, the maximal area. So this is closely related to Jacobson's proposal that um, the vacuum entanglement entropy is maximal or that the entanglement entropy is maximal in the vacuum. 
uh, or more precisely that the generalized entropy of small diamonds is maximal at fixed volume as, as we saw in the beginning. And the goal, uh, one of the goals of our paper was to generalize uh, the De Sitter first law to finite causal diamonds. So here you see that the, the De Sitter causal diamond, this is a finite causal diamond of radius R. Um, and we focus on the sitter space, but uh, the first law also holds for flat space and ADS, pure ADS. And then um, from this first law, we can actually derive the stationarity of generalized entropy um, for maximally symmetric diamonds of any size. So not only, not only small diamonds, as Jacobson argued, um, or uh, the sitter uh, cosmological horizon. But for any any size diamonds. So if you if you take ADS space and take one of these uh, causal diamonds and push the, the the tips to to the boundary, do you recover uh, the, the the statement about you know like linearization equations from uh, Rito Kanagi and how? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like you mean the ADS Rinsler wedge? So yeah, we studied that case. Um, so that is like a sub. Uh, uh, or a limiting case of our uh, first law. Okay, super. Yeah. Okay, so what is a causal diamond? So we consider like a spherical ball inside the static patch, and this ball has a uh, vanishing extrinsic curvature. And then uh, the causal diamond is defined as the domain of dependence of this spherical ball. Uh, so here's the spherical ball, or equivalently, it's really the um, intersection of the future of this point and the past of this point. Um, yeah, so this we 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 consider very like spherically symmetric diamonds. So they have and they have a reflection symmetry here and a rotation symmetry there. Um, okay, so a useful coordinate system for describing these diamonds in the sitter space is is the following. Uh, where R star is a, a tortoise coordinate and U and V are light cone coordinates. And then the null boundary is really uh, where um, U and V take particular values of the tortoise coordinate. Um, this also shows that the sitter space is conformal to um, hyperbolic space times time, because this is really uh, hyperbolic space times time between brackets. Okay, uh, crucially, these uh, maximally symmetric diamonds, they don't have a time-like uh, killing symmetry, but they have a conformal killing symmetry. So what that means, so we, this is quite familiar for flat space actually, this conformal killing factor, but uh, it also holds for uh, other maximally symmetric causal diamonds. So what is a conformal killing vector? Well, that uh, uh, defined as the lead derivative of the metric with respect to the conformal killing vector is really proportional to the metric, where alpha is, um, is proportional to the divergence of the conformal killing vector. Um, and since uh, the sitter space is conformally flat, uh, just like ADS, uh, uh, it inherits the same conformal group as flat space. And um, yeah, there's really, you can show that there is a unique conformal killing vector which generates a flow inside the diamond. Um, and here is the form of the conformal killing vector in the coordinates I sh showed above. Um, and it's time like, so it's time like in. Uh, uh, on the inside of the diamond and it's null on the outside, it vanishes at the boundary of, of sigma and at the uh, tips. And since it's, um, since it's null on the uh, null boundary, that null boundary is a conformal killing horizon uh, with a bifurcation surface, um, uh, which is equal to the edge of the ball. And this conformal killing horizon has a well-defined surface gravity, 
that is uh, also wow invariant. Um, so this is work by uh, uh, Jacobson and Kong. And the definition of surface gravity is like this. The, the well invariant definition of surface gravity is like this. Um, and what we showed in our paper is that the surface gravity is constant on any bifurcate conformal killing horizon. So not only for maximally symmetric diamonds, but for any bifurcate conformal killing horizon. Uh, both on the null generators and on the bifurcation surface. So this is like a zeroth law uh, zero, uh, of thermodynamics. And um, yeah, that gives some confidence that um, conf bifurcate conformal killing horizons are, I mean, have thermodynamic properties, and in particular causal diamonds. Okay, so um, this is a result for the first law of maximally symmetric diamonds. Um, so the way we derive it is using um, Walt and Ayer's um, formalism. So there's really uh, a neuter identity that follows from the diffeomorphism invariance that holds for any uh, diffeomorphism invariant Lagrangian. Uh, for any vector fields, um, and I wrote it down uh, on shell, um, in particular for these diamonds. So this is the Hamiltonian that generates um, the flow along this vector field. This is the Noether charge uh, form, and it's integrated over the bifurcation surface. So uh, what we need, what we did is we evaluated this um, for these diamonds, where theta is now the conformal killing factor. And um, we focused on Einstein gravity, minimally coupled to fluid matter. So the Hamiltonian splits into two terms. And the neuter charge actually is equal to um, minus kappa over a pi g delta a, where the minus sign is of course important and it uh, originates from the fact that the flow inside the diamond <coughs> sorry is future pointing whereas outside the diamond it's past pointing so here it's future pointing and outside it's past pointing uh, past pointing whereas for black holes it's the opposite it's past pointing inside a black hole and future pointing outside. So that's where the minus sign comes from. Sorry, I really have a cold actually. <coughs> okay. So uh, the next thing is to um, evaluate this gravitational Hamiltonian variation um, for these diamonds. And what is very interesting is that it's proportional to the volume of the ball, sigma. Um, <coughs> so here, uh, small k is the trace of the extrinsic curvature of the edge. And this is in, um, in the sitter space. So r is the radius and l is the, the sitter radius. r is the radius of the ball. Um, yes, and so the matter Hamiltonian variation is again as this form. So the, yeah, it's very interesting that there is a volume term that arises from this gravitational Hamiltonian. And that is of course absent in the black hole case because there um, we typically derive a first law for killing horizons, which admit a true killing factor. But um, if you have a conformal killing factor, then, then this term uh, arises, this delta V. So that's why um, this doesn't appear in the black hole case. And it does here. Any questions about this? 
but you you don't interpret you do you interpret this volume contribution as as what as a, as an energy contribution or entropic contribution? Very good as an as an energy. Um, I'll get to that in in two slides. So first, I wanted to uh, um, point out to like maybe um, some intuitive ways of understanding this result. So. Um, Let's suppose we consider variations that fix the volume. Then the first law implies that the uh, for positive um, matter Hamiltonian variation, that the uh, energy decreases the area because of this minus sign. And let me now try to explain this in this picture. <laughs> so this is just a way of understanding how matter occurs uh, space time. So, uh, so we have to fix the volume. So let's say you start with flat space with a fixed volume um, and you add some, some uh, energy, then um, because of the space-time curvature, previously the area was here, for example, but because of the space-time curvature, the area really decreases if you fix this space-time volume because there's more volume Come, uh, arising due to the uh, curvature. Okay, so uh, um, oppositely, you could also fix the area, and that tells you that the um, that the energy increases the volume. So this is maybe even easier. So if you fix the area, then you immediately see that there is more volume <coughs> due to the uh, space-time curvature. Okay. Now, this volume really um, arose from the gravitational Hamiltonian variation. And this might remind you of <coughs> an old result by York that the um, gravitational Hamiltonian is the volume actually for a particular uh, time. Uh, which is the what is now known as the York time, which is the uh, trace of the extrinsic curvature. So we studied the uh, extrinsic curvature trace um, of like slices that end at the edge, like this. Can you see this? Yeah. So like these slices. <coughs> and what we showed is that it's proportional to the, the cinch of uh, the conformal killing time. So this is a time that really runs from minus infinity to infinity inside the diamond. Um, and what this tells you is that um, um, slices with fixed conformal killing time also have constant uh, mean curvature. So that the, um, the foliation of conformal killing time is really the same as the uh, constant mean curvature foliation of the diamond. Um, yes. So that's why it's not, well, that explains actually why we found the volume. So in, in formulas, if you take the, um, time to be k instead of s, then uh, your uh, Hamiltonian variation will, will uh, look like this, which is related to the um, Hamiltonian variation uh, that generates conformal killing flow uh, in this way. So um, the difference or the, the proportionality factor really is um, the uh, uh, derivative of, of the time, the York time with respect to the conformal killing time evaluated. So what we do is we evaluate at this surface, which is has zero mean curvature and is also like uh, 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 the S is zero slice. Um, yeah, so this, so the upshot of this is that the volume variation is really a gravitational Hamiltonian variation. And you can equivalently describe it as, um, as the uh, York time Hamiltonian. 
if you choose a different time. So that, yeah, the, the reason why we had this particular prefactor, uh, sorry, scroll so like this is really because we we chose a particular time, the conformal killing time. So is there a relation between uh, what you're just saying and uh, these papers by uh, Alex Bellin and collaborators? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> of course, there is. Um, I mean, they also look at your time um, in the book. Um, what we do is really an empty ADS, whereas this York time, you can define it in any any type of space time. So that's way more general. And it's always proportional to the volume. But, um, uh, and they, and they, they, um, they show that, or they, yeah, they show that this volume variation is related to some boundary symplectic form. Um, so their paper is, is just a new dictionary in ADS-CFT, whereas our results are more just about gravity. But it would be really, so that was one of my outlook points as well, <laughs> it would be really interesting to um, see what this first law means in ADS-CFT and like their dictionary might help in that. Yes. Um, and, and it's really exciting because, because it's, well, this volume is so universal and it's in gravity, it's always the gravity, it's, it's always the Hamiltonian if for this your time. So I'm like, uh, I mean, there are many, many details here in, in, in the construction, but like you are, are you trying to say that this volume appears naturally because you're not using the killing vectors, but you're using conformal killing vectors. Yeah, that's the reason why we found this volume. But then here I'm arguing that it's, it's even more general if you don't have a conformal killing vector because okay. that's also very specific, right? I mean, only in, in these conformally flat space times you have that, but um, that's why I think this first law might generalize to non-maximally symmetric spaces as well if you, if you uh, use the York time instead of the conformal killing time. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's not so specific. I mean, yeah, it's, it depends on this particular gauge, but. Um, yeah, so some, some interesting generalizations. Um, you can add a variation of the cosmological constant in, an, in a very easy way that hasn't been noticed very much in the literature. It's just by um, very like I had a term where I varied the stress tensor. Now, if you just insert a stress tensor associated to the cosmological constant, <coughs> then you get this new term, um, where the prefactor is uh, is basically the uh, integral. Sorry. Is the integral over the norm of, um, of data. So this is known, <clears throat> this is related to um, work by these people where they call this the thermodynamic volume because it multiplies lambda. If you interpret lambda as pressure, then this is like a VDP term. But it's really just the um, redshifted proper volume. So that might be better terminology. And the second generalization is um, uh, to any higher derivative theory of gravity, which we did in a previous paper with uh, Bueno, Esperanza, and Vincent Min. And then instead of the area, you get the Wald entropy. And instead of the volume, you get what we call a generalized entropy, where this E, A, B, C, D is uh, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, the Riemann tensor. Um, so this actually also would be interesting in connection to complexity. So maybe, maybe this is like the generalization of uh, complexity equals volume to high derivative gravity. 
but this specific formula I think only holds for spherical uh, regions because yeah that's how we derived it but you might uh, you might actually find a more general formula for other other types of regions yeah. okay so let me now go to the thermodynamic interpretation um, So we saw this minus sign, um, and well, again here, right? Um, we can uh, we we basically have to impose uh, that the temperature is negative in order to get the uh, uh, to that to get a correct first law. And all the previous arguments I gave um, for negative temperature for the sitter space also apply to maximally symmetric causal diamonds. Um, so in the semi-classical regime, so if you um, include quantum corrections to the matter fields, then you um, basically have to, have to separate this matter term, uh, um, and then you get this, this type of first law. So next, what I wanted to do is to derive the stationarity of generalized entropy. Um, so the... Um, so I first wanted to do it for conformal matter. So for conformal matter, um, we know that the vacuum state restricted to actually any maximally symmetric causal diamond is thermal, where the modular Hamiltonian has this uh, local form. And then using the first law of entanglement, uh, in this way, we can rewrite the, the, the quantum first law uh, that I wrote here in terms of the generalized entropy. So basically we replace this term by a matter entropy term and then we combine that with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And then the signs actually also work out in the in the way I described it before. Um, so that you get um, uh, this equation or this equation. So this, this shows that this negative temperature is also really consistent when you include quantum corrections to matter. So this shows that if you fix the volume, if you have yeah, fixed the volume and the cosmological constant, then you get the stationary condition for generalized entropy uh, for diamonds of any size. Okay, so for non-conformal matter, um, we need an additional assumption, which only holds for small diamonds. So the assumption is that um, the modular Hamiltonian and the um, integral of the stress tensor, the variations of those are still related, but they, um, there's an additional piece. Um, and this X is a Lorentz scalar that can depend on the size of the diamond. Now, this assumption has been checked by, by these people, but if we, if, we, uh, if we assume that assumption and, and basically insert it in the, in the first law, then we get an extra piece here. So compared to this equation, if you follow all the steps, then, then you get an extra piece like this, where now, I denoted um, uh, the, the local cosmological constant in small diamonds with a small lambda. And then if you define this to be like a new, a new quantity, the variation of, of some new quantity, then fixing that one, that, uh, that space-time constant and fixing the volume, you again get the stationarity of generalized entropy for non-conformal fields. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that was about generalized entropy, but there's actually a nice way to understand, to, yeah, to reformulate the first law in terms of the free energy, so which is defined as the Hamiltonian that generates conformal killing flow minus the negative temperature times the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, and um, this free energy is stationary at fixed temperature because of the first law. 
Um, and this implies that maximally symmetric diamonds are in thermal equilibrium at negative temperature. Um, and it's actually interesting that the stationarity of generalized entropy at fixed volume and cosmological constant and the stationarity of free energy, they both follow from this first law. And one can show that they are uh, equivalent. Isn't there a typo in the middle equation uh, in the sense that there, there should be like a T times delta S? Or is it uh, no, so I've used the first law. So I've, So if you vary this, then here you get two terms. So I've canceled the variation of the Hamiltonian. Oh, okay. Oh, against, okay. The, against the variation of the entropy. Because you said that you keep the temperature fixed, so I thought that the variation. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Sorry. So this is really I do that here. <laughs> so here I'm using the first law, and then here I'm keeping the temperature fixed, and that's why it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how much time I have left. So I was planning on, on showing you the, the uh, derivation of the Einstein equation from the free energy. I mean, my suggestion would be to close like in about 10 minutes, but uh, if you can just turn on. 10 minutes, okay. Well, let's see how far I get. Um, so um, locally at a point, uh, we know that the metric is flat. Uh, so now if you consider a small causal diamond centered at any point in space-time, uh, you know that this is uh, like a small deformation of a flat empty diamond. And a flat empty diamond is in thermal equilibrium, as we saw above. Hence, uh, a small diamond in space-time, which is this small deformation of a flat diamond, is in near thermal equilibrium. And in that way, you can view space-time really as a medium everywhere near local thermodynamic equilibrium, just like a fluid. So in part one of the talk, I've derived the stationarity of free energy from the semi-classical Einstein equation. And now we want to turn the logic around and derive the Einstein equation from the stationarity of free energy. So that the principle is really that um, any small causal diamond at every point in space-time is close to being in thermal equilibrium in the sense that it is the variation of a flat causal diamond with the same free energy. So uh, the, the free energy is stationary at fixed negative temperature. And the advantages of, of, this, of this new input assumption compared to the um, input assumption of the stationarity of generalized entropy is that we don't have to fix the volume here, uh, nor um, do we have to treat conformal and non-conformal matter on a, on a separate footing. So, so the, 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 the reason why conformal matter was special is that like when using the Hamilton first law, like you, you want to use explicit form of modular homophonic. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it was special. But like for non conformal matter, wasn't the argument that we have to look at small enough uh, causal diamonds so that like we are in the vicinity of the unit fixed point and then uh, I mean it's conformal anyway? Yes, right. But if for non conformal matter, I had to um, uh, well introduce this, this new big lambda. Um, uh, Yeah, so which, which really involved this x, but this x was zero for conformal matter. So, I mean, it's, it's consistent, but uh, preferably you, you don't want such a different so, treatment. So, to understand, so, so this x was related to the leading order deformation from outside from conformality? This is the case? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, for small causal diamonds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. was it was really crucial, I mean, like without it, like we wouldn't go through. Like uh... that assumption is really crucial in deriving okay. the Ein yeah, in Jacobson's 2015 paper, even in deriving the Einstein equation with cosmological constant okay. for okay. non-conformal matter. Okay, so um, so I'm starting again with the same free energy, but now we want to keep the, the input assumptions as minimal as possible. So um, uh, here uh, with S, I actually take it to be the, entang the, U yeah, the entanglement entropy associated to UV degrees of freedom near the edge. 
uh, which in quantum field theory is divergent and is proportional to the area. But in quantum gravity, it's expected to be finite due to a universal uh, UV cutoff. Um, so we really just take the entropy to be proportional to the area with a universal uh, constant in front. Uh, the temperature, we take it to be the Hawking temperature, except that um, uh, we keep its sign undetermined. So regarding the energy that receives two contributions, both from matter fields and from the metric, um, and um, yeah, we have an argument from diffeomorphism invariance that the gravitational Hamiltonian is really proportional to the volume. And um, uh, yeah, this is the formula where this is the temperature, the, this universal constant, and the trace of the extrinsic curvature of the edge. Um, okay, so and this this matter Hamiltonian variation is really just the integral over the stress tensor contracted with the conformal killing factor. Okay, so if you insert all the equations I had in the previous slides, then you get that the variation of the free energy at fixed temperature um, is this. And now we will evaluate this for small diamonds. So the matter Hamiltonian variation to leading order in this uh, ratio, where this is the excit typical excitation length scale for quantum fields, and L is a small L is the radius of the ball. Uh, that's equal to this, the leading order, um, where this prefactor arises from the norm of the killing factor integrated over the volume, um, this thermodynamic volume. I, uh, and then, so this is really just uh, integrating stress energy. And then there's a geometric result, um, well, basically by Jacobson, that the area variation and volume variation combine into the Einstein tensor to leading order in this ratio, um, where you get the same prefactor, uh, remarkably. And this is derived using Riemann normal coordinates. Now, if you uh, insert two and three into one, and you impose stationarity of free energy, then you can derive this equation, which already looks a lot like the Einstein equation. So this really imposes stationary free energy for all uh, time-like unit normals and at each point in space-time. So uh, the last step is to identify the temperature with the negative Hawking temperature, where I've put the uh, surface gravity equal to one in the entire derivation. And the uh, universal constant has to be one over four G H bar. And then the derived equation turns into the semi-classical Einstein equation. So note that it was actually crucial uh, that the temperature was negative because otherwise um, we would have a negative sign here, um, which is equivalent to saying that gravity is repulsive. So the attractiveness, attractiveness of gravity really hinges on the negativity of temperature. And we have a separate argument for the negativity of um, the temperature, basically again from the generalized entropy. And also note that the entropy is just the standard Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Okay, so let me conclude. So maximally symmetric causal diamonds are thermodynamic equilibrium states at negative temperature. And we have derived the stationarity of generalized entropy and of free energy from a first law for maximally symmetric diamonds. And in the second part, we have derived the Einstein equation from the condition that every small causal diamond is a variation of a flat empty diamond with the same free energy. And the attractiveness of gravity uh, depended on the negativity of the temperature. So as an outlook, well, we already discussed some of these points, but um, I believe that the 
first law for causal diamonds can be generalized to non maximally symmetric spaces um, if you take the York time as your uh, as your time instead of conformal killing time. But yeah, this has to be worked out still. And then it would be interesting to really interpret or understand this first law, let's say for a very large causal diamond in pure ADS in terms of the CFT. And perhaps um, in terms of complexity, where the volume is complexity, or uh, using this um, work by Belen, Lukovic, and Sarosi. Um, and another in the future direction is to derive the thermodynamics I discussed from a Euclidean path integral. And perhaps one can even derive the negativ negativity of the temperature in the microcanonical ensemble. Oh, and then I had a last slide as an advertisement for my essay that will appear tomorrow. Thank you. All right, thanks. So, um, are there any questions online or uh, we have some questions here in Poznan. So maybe in a summary, what is the main difference of these causal diamond uh, thermodynamics compared to, let's say, normal black holes like Schwarzschild uh, thermodynamics? Is it like the appearance of a negative temperature? I think so, yeah. I think that is a really interesting um, aspect of these causal diamonds. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is the volume variation, which you don't have for black holes. And it's what is also funny is that like for black holes, you kind of look at the outside of the black hole, whereas here you look at the inside of a causal diamond. Yeah. And I think that difference also translates into uh, negative temperature, for example. Yeah. Uh, Manus, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, a very nice talk. Uh, what about, uh, what is the sign of the heat capacity in your calculation? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, uh, it could be positive, actually, uh, now that I think about it. Because then I... you're going to have to reverse also the sign and the temperature. Uh -huh. so oh, I'm right. a bit confused yeah. about that. I know that. I know that for the sitter space, for the cosmological horizon, because the specific heat is really T D T D S D T, right? Um, so it, I thought that it didn't depend on ah. the sign of the temperature. And I know that for the sitter cosmological horizon, it is negative, I think. But we didn't discuss it in the paper, so that's a good point. Okay. That, right? I thought it was negative for, for the, the Sitter um, cosmological rise, just like for black holes. For the, for the asymptotically flat black hole. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering whether your analysis shed some light on this long-standing issue of the negative heat capacity of the of the asymptotically flat solution hmm. um if so, i'm like just just to add on this i'm like i'm not sure uh precisely how it connects with with ignatius comment but I, I i was thinking that like how about like putting the the causal diamond outside the horizon of the schwarzschild black hole right yeah uh that is a possibility yes um in mm -hmm. Well, you're kind of doing that already, um, right? When you derive um, the first law, because you take a slice that really goes from infinity to the horizon. Oh, yeah. But in that case, it's. Um, temperature is positive. But so, yeah, I, I don't think that our work bears on uh, the specific heat of black holes. But 
I don't know what the specific heat of coils of diamonds is. Okay, thanks. But if, if, it, if it were positive, that would be very interesting, of course. Uh, Anything else? Okay, um, so uh, thanks, thanks, Manos, uh, again.